Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Keen, Professor of History at Chapman University in Orange, California. Thanks so much for joining me today for a lecture entitled Uncle Sam Wants You, American Soldiers in the Great War. I'm recording this lecture on November 10th, 2022, a day before Veterans Day. I thought it might be interesting for us to start with Veterans Day, which actually became an official holiday only in 1954. Before that, it was known as Armistice Day, and that's a day that has its origins in the First World War. So it's fairly appropriate that we're talking about the First World War at this particular moment. Now, on the 11th hour of the 11th month of the 11th day of November in 1918, the armistice was signed. And this was the agreement between the Allies that ended fighting on the Western Front. And it was a joyous occasion throughout the world, as you can see from these headlines and from these scenes of crowds cheering, throwing confetti, and generally celebrating the end of this horrendous conflict. We have soldiers' accounts as well of Americans overseas who kind of mark that occasion. And here's a really good one from James Henschel, who writes to his parents, if only you could all see how glad everyone in this place is. Never in my life have I ever seen such happy people, for the 11th of November meant the biggest thing possible to them all. Fighting stopped. At last, the German people have awakened from their horrible dream. It's taken a long time, four years and a half of the sort of thing that France has been through is tremendous. And now that it's all over, why it's almost too much for them to believe. Now, Americans had not been at war for four and a half years. They had been at war for about 18 months because the United States did not enter the war until April of 1917. But even though Americans had a shorter war than the Europeans and by no means achieved the same scale of casualties or wounded that, um, that the Europeans did, the war nonetheless left a mark on Americans of that generation. It was an intense conflict over those 18 months, about six months of hard fought uh, conflict against Germany. And we can kind of see that in just six months of fighting, the United States suffered nearly 53,000 uh, battle deaths um, and almost 204,000 wounded. And these would be men who were returning to the United States. On this chart that I have, I also have marking other deaths, uh, 63,000 uh, approximately. You might be wondering what are those deaths account uh, attributed to? Um, well, we've just been through a three-year pandemic, so I think we all know the answer to that now, which we may not have known three years ago. Most of those deaths came from the influenza pandemic of 1918. But what's interesting is noting in comparison to other wars that, of course, Korea and Vietnam where medical advances were so much farther along, the, the, de the battlefield deaths were actually much less. So in, in a short period of time, America's experiences this intense uh, rate of death, um, a, a terrible pandemic, and, and numerous wounded coming home. And to Americans in 1918, it was, they were happy that peace had been declared, but they also wanted to mark this, this war. They wanted to commemorate it. They wanted people to remember the sacrifices that had been made. And we have a very important marker uh, in our national commemorative landscape, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And this again takes us to Armistice Day, now known as Veterans Day, because in 1921, the United States buried its unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. And this had been um, a commemorative practice initiated a year earlier by France and Britain. And the US followed suit by using this Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to commemorate the deaths and to have our final resting place, symbolic final resting place for all the missing of the war. And the American case that numbered about 4,500 men. Now, this gives us a good sense of the pomp and circumstances surrounded this solemn event. The, the casket lay in state in the Capitol and then was drawn by this horse-drawn uh, horse cart uh, to, national, to Arlington National Cemetery, where uh, the entire U.S. government, uh, dignitaries from around the world, witnessed this, this solemn moment. And at this moment, um, 
President Warren Harding tried to give a meaning to his death and to talk a little bit about what this, this moment meant. And in his speech, he proclaimed, we do not know the eminence of his birth, but we do know the glory of his death. He died for his country and no greater devotion has no man than this. He died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in his heart and hope on his lips that his country should triumph and its civilization survive. Now, these are words from a president that are perfectly appropriate for such a moment when you're, you're entombing the casket of the unknown soldier and you are asking for two minutes of silence across the nation to think about the sacrifices um, necessary to bring this terrible war to an end. But I wanted to also point out that by the 1930s, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier actually became a somewhat contested symbolic figure. Because by then, people were questioning what had this war been about? Had it been necessary for the United States to, to enter? And so we begin to see in some of the literature of the time, some questionings and some counters to the, to the meaning that Harding in 1921 gave to, to, the, to the, um, the erection of the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, Harlem Renaissance artist James Weldon Johnson, for example, wrote a poem in 1930 called St. Peter Relates an Incident of the Resurrection Day. And in this poem, he creates scenes of gen general pandemonium when on Resurrection Day, the unknown soldier rises from the dead and it is revealed to Americans that he is in fact an African American. We have other questionings of of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and the words that Harding attributed to this, to this death from another um, uh, our author and William March, who himself was a veteran, writing in his, his uh, novel, Company K, um, about a character who throws away his identification tags as he's dying on the barbed wire in no man's land, proclaiming, as I have here, nobody will ever use me as a symbol. No one will ever tell lies over my dead body now. And so the reason I'm recounting this, besides giving us a sense of a little more understanding of where Veterans Day comes from and its origins in World War I, is to really help us appreciate that this was a war whose meaning was always contested. It was contested from the time that people began uh, mobilizing an army and thinking about serving in it, um, sometimes while they were still overseas, and certainly when they came home. And so some of the questions that I want to begin asking for us today is what did the war mean for men who served in the wartime army? And maybe give us a little bit more texture to our understanding about the soldier experience in the war. And then finally thinking about the impact of the war on this, this generation. And I'm hinting at a few things here in this, in this introduction. So I started at the end and now I'm going to go back to the beginning, uh, sort of messing around a little bit with our, with our chronology here. And considering how the United States raised its military and as men were entering the kinds of uh, ways that they gave voice to their understandings of the war and what they believed they were fighting for. Now Woodrow Wilson in the war dress of course had ushered uttered, excuse me, some famous phrases that we associate with World War I, the idea of the world must be made safe for democracy and creating a lasting peace um, that would make this the war to end all wars. And these were very, you know, broad idealistic goals and, and people certainly um, were enthused by them. But what we find is that people had to find other reasons besides that to understand why they personally were invested in going and fighting in this conflict. Now, in terms of raising the, the wartime force, there were, there were two methods. One, early on in the war, um, people could volunteer. And then of course, um, later on, um, the majority of the force was going to be conscripted. So conscription comes into uh, uh, being right away, but people as they were registering for the draft still had the option of volunteering until about December uh, 1917. And then the army was primarily only going to rely on, on uh, conscripts. And I think that we get a sense of uncertainty from the government about whether or not men were gonna show up in the numbers that the United States government needed uh, to fight this war through, first of all, this huge propaganda effort that we say it's the first centralized propaganda 
uh, effort by the federal government in any conflicts to date, um, and also some of the headlines of the of the time. So there's a big push to get people to volunteer, and then you can see even in the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, headline, which is really one of my personal favorites. Um, and this is on June 5th, which is the first registration day for the draft. Uh, enrolling Liberty Army, Patriots will register gladly, all others must, which I think kind of succinctly states the situation about as well as one, one, one can. So when we want to understand why men served and what meaning they were looking for the war, we have to go a little bit beyond Woodrow Wilson's speech. And I always like to let people speak for themselves. And let's look at some of the things, some of the reasons, and, and with some of the significance that men themselves uh, connected to their war experience. So this is a great propaganda poster because I think it's actually expresses sentiments that were very effective in encouraging men to either enlist or to comply with um, selective service regulations. And you have this image of a rather well-to-do man who's kind of shamefully hiding in the shadows with his back turned, um, look, gazing almost wistfully um, outside at this group of men who are healthy and hearty, marching in the sunlight under a huge American flag kind of conveying the idea of masculinity, of patriotism, of unity. I mean, all positive attributes that can encourage a person to believe that they want to be part of what, as this soldier here, marked a great adventure. And the idea that this was the, the great adventure that, uh, that was being offered up to this generation. And if you missed out, you would regret it for the rest of your life. This was a very predominant theme that attracted a lot of men to military service. Um, and, and the romanticism of, mil of serving your country and, and being honored for it, these were all things that we see in soldiers' letters and memoirs and diaries here. Here's another, another quote kind of connected to a different types of propaganda. These are not government propaganda posters. There's a lot of privately produced propaganda during the war as well. And these were companies that kind of got into the propaganda game and people wanted to buy these and they wanted to put them up in their houses or maybe um, attach them to uh, uh, advertisements. So we have a lot of paraphernalia from the time that also gives us insight into the psyche of the, of the, uh, of the American population here. And this idea of duty and honor and how it's connected to your family family's reputation and your family's expectations of you, I think is sometimes underappreciated. Um, but we see that a lot. And it's, this is, again, a great quote that kind of encapsulates that. Our people back home expected of us. My parents wouldn't want to say after the war is over that their son didn't go to the front lines, and now they won't have to say it. Most of the men who were uh, enlisting or being drafted were single, even though these propaganda posters show married men. Married men were far in the minority in the First World War. And their letters are mostly back to their parents and they're chock full of, of ways to make sure that their parents remain proud of them while they're, while they're in service. And here you can see uh, for both a white family and an African-American family, portraits that are really showing family veneration of, of the husband who and father who's serving their, their country. So the, the, the way that your family would connect to you was, was quite important for many men as well. Now I did mention that most of the men who were entering were single. So there were some other attractions to military service, I have to say. So I wanted to show you these because I love these here. Because there was also the sense of just, you know, uh, you got to love a man in uniform and, and the idea of, of the, um, the romance and a sort of sexually charged moment as well, not suggesting that's why men um, <laughs> went enlisted, but it certainly was another way in which being in uniform at this moment elevated your status at home and made you attractive to lots of women. And, and these are postcards that are uh, in a joking fashion, like really acknowledging that, that, that there's also a way in which your appeal and your status uh, in the eyes of the opposite sex are enhanced by you serving in, in uniform. Um, this reality um, uh, of sort of sexually charged um, 
uh, that the, the war had sort of become a kind of sexually charged moment for a lot of young men entering the service, also pre preoccupied military officials. One of the things they were super concerned about was uh, an escalating uh, venereal disease Great. And so we start seeing different kinds of propaganda that's aimed at soldiers as they enter the training camps to encourage them to basically practice safe sex. And they uh, introduce uh, sex education uh, lectures into the training curriculum to encourage um, uh, soldiers to be careful, uh, to see what treatment there is available. Of course, is a prepellant penicillin error. So if you contract venereal disease, you become ineligible to go to France. And so it was both a concern over the moral morality and the health of, of individual soldiers, but it was also a broader manpower consideration because you would re literally reduce the numbers of men that you could send over to fight if you started having huge problems with with venereal disease. So we see some, some interesting, um, interesting uh, responses to the idea of, of, uh, of, of romance being very much on soldiers' minds here. Political sentiments were not absent from pol soldiers' political, or from soldiers' commentary to their loved ones um, at the moment. Uh, we see certainly lots of comments from them about this sense of of seeing the Germans as bestial, as, le as less than human, as committing terrible atrocities. And this is where we see both American propaganda and, and some of the comments that Wilson had made in his war's dress, but also, you know, Americans have been fed over, you know, two and a half years, a very steady diet of, of news stories that are recounting atrocities that are committed by German soldiers as they as they invade Europe, especially through the sweep through Belgium and the so-called rape of Belgium, and also when they turn to um, uh, using submarine warfare and the torpedoing of ships carrying civilians. You can think of things like the Lusitania sinking that all kind of create this image in American society of the Germans as as sort of beasts that have to be have to be sub subdued, and and here I don't think I need to read this, but you can see how it pairs very well with this with this idea of of, of Germans being this mad brute that has to be has to be contained here. Now, those things might not be so surprising to you to think that uh, you know Americans had obviously assimilated a lot of the news stories and the the messaging that they were that uh, German that British propagandists and then later American propagandists were were painting to make people really believe that Germany posed a direct threat to the United States. But what's interesting again as we look at the soldiers' letters is how many men began to look at military service as perhaps offering them um, something else than the ability to um, serve their country, defeat the Germans, uh, you know, be more attractive to, to female companions um, and to make their parents proud. They began to think, and this is the progressive era, everybody's thinking about, you know, moral uplift and economic opportunity and, and men begin to connect military service to the idea that serving in the military can also become a stepping stone into a better life. That there are positive things that an individual will gain by serving in the military that will aid them and help them progress sort of up the socioeconomic ladder. And they didn't get these ideas just, you know, in, in a vacuum or in the abstract. They got them because the military began promoting this idea, the idea that military service actually would turn you into a better person. And Pershing even wrote letters to all American parents saying this, that at the end of the war, he said, wrote letters and said, I return your son to you a better man. And by saying that, it was certainly the idea because someone had served well for the country, but it was also the idea that in this modern military, soldiers were going to be cared for and they were going to get opportunities that they had not perhaps previously had. So you can see in all of this um, where the you have these apples that that the that the soldier is is gathering, and it's all things about 
you know, um, eating well, getting regular medical care, living an, living an upright life, education, training, ambition, confidence, thrift, uh, being a good citizen. You know, that these are all positive things that you're gonna draw from military service. And this little one in the corner is very interesting because the idea that an honorable discharge from the military at the end of the war will basically be a job reference for you. And this will be something that you will be able to use to sort of catapult yourself into a better position. And this is where I kind of had, well, I had emphasized before many of these soldiers are single. And this is a good moment to remind ourselves that most of these men are also working class. And so this idea that they could gain things that, that would help them advance economically, I think is quite important. What always sort of strikes me and a lot of soldier correspondents is how much they talk about what they're eating. And at first you can think, well, they can't really talk about a lot else. But I think part of it is for, for some of these, these men, the idea that they're, they're eating meats and different kinds of foods, I mean, they're eating a diet that's very different than what they may have eaten in civilian life. And it is an example of, of, of the weight gain and the growth that they're experiencing are positive attributes at that particular moment for them. I love this couple that I've spent some time reading their letters, Dwight and Lucille Fee, and they have a great correspondence about this, about their hopes of sort of using Dwight's military service to advance their, their, uh, their hopes for the, for the future. Um, and and, and they, they talk a lot about their finances and about how they're going to you know, hopefully improve their post-war lives. They talk about the possibility that Dwight might become an officer. He actually never does hope, you know, and then that would be a great stepping stone for him in terms of, of, a, of a different career path. Um, but what's also interesting is how Dwight encourages his wife, Lucille, to get a job at home. And this might be kind of challenging to our, our gendered expectations of this period in time, but what they're sort of planning as a couple is that he's he's in the military he's going to come home with this great you know perhaps status as an officer certainly an honorable discharge so that's going to make him very marketable and she's going to take uh, the opportunity of there being a labor shortage on the home front to get a job and save money and and um and invest her money so that they can create, they can gather a little nest egg for themselves that they could perhaps parlay into a down payment for a home, for a car. They talk about buying, buying new clothes and, and they're really seeing the war and they're super patriotic. I'm not trying to, to suggest that they don't talk about, you know, their desire to defeat Germany together and the importance of, of the war for national security, but they also really talk quite a bit about their investment strategies, especially in something called Liberty Bonds, which we I'm sure we've heard of. And, and what's quite uh, striking to me is that our normal view of this is that people buy these because they just wanna you know, help do their bit for the nation. But in many cases, there are secondary motives here. And the government is, again, acknowledging those secondary moment, uh, motives um, you know, about this is, a, this is a great tool for investing in your future. And yet a lot of working class people did not necessarily think about investing their money. This isn't a time when a lot of people are buying stock or have mutual funds or things like we have today. And I'm going to tell you, if I could get a savings account that paid 4% interest, I'd be on it right now too. So, so it's actually a good return on your investment. So besides um, um, in, encouraging people to do it, people are sort of learning how to invest their money and thinking along, along, those, along those lines. Um, and in fact, one of the uh, the disappointments that they end up having in a little bit, not they're certainly not unhappy that the war ends quickly, but they never really get to uh, to um, uh, fulfill this grand strategy they have about of how many liberty bonds they're going to pay and and how long they're going to actually actually hold them. So another important thing to think about when we think about the expectations that Americans had of their military service is to recognize the diversity of American society at that time. A lot of the people that I've been talking about up until this point are white sort of native born soldiers, but this is also a time of great immigration to the United States from Europe. And that reality is reflected in the composition of the American military. 
one out of five soldiers is foreign born. That's 20% of the US Army. So when we think about the attractions of military service and the idea that military service can offer you in addition to a way to serve your country, other potential positive attributes, um, pushing hard, um, we see uh, military officials pushing hard with the idea of military service as a way to prove that you're American and also to give you tools for assimilation. So I mentioned a little bit about sex education classes that are being introduced. Well, English language classes are also being introduced. The idea that perhaps immigrant soldiers who have lived in ethnic enclaves where they've been speaking their, their mother tongue, um, reading foreign language publications, not really had ways to uh, assimilate into mainstream society, the military is offering you a path. Um, lots of these soldiers are naturalized uh, while they're in military, while they're in the military. And military service for many of them becomes a path to citizenship and also a path to assimilation, and and this is appealing to a lot of a lot of uh, of immigrant soldiers of that era, and of course we also have an important component of African American soldiers who are in the war, and here I think we begin to see um, soldiers who share many of the sort of common expectations or goals that I've, that I've laid out earlier, but, but with a twist. And of course, with a very specific goal of trying to improve uh, civil rights within the United States. And we see many African-American soldiers, and especially educated, college educated uh, African-American soldiers looking to the war as, as a moment whereby serving honorably and, and receiving recognition for that service, they will be able to help advance the cause of civil rights in the United States. This is a very bad time for civil rights in the United States. There, there's, there's lynchings, there's mob violence, there's been some, some truly horrible things happening um, throughout the country in, uh, in 1914, 15, 16, and 17. Um, it's not necessarily a moment that would lend itself to optimism about the future of civil rights in the United States, but we do see uh, African-American soldiers uh, entering the military, hoping that in fact things can turn around. And I have a, a great quote here from a man named Charles Hamilton Houston, who was young, he was only 17 years old, and he entered into a, a segregated camp that was meant to train black officers. And this actually was a victory for the civil rights movement because the War Department initially had no interest in training black officers. They weren't even sure what they were going to do with the black uh, citizens that they were that they were uh, conscripting or, or who, were, who were volunteering. But the NAACP along with other civil rights organizations manages to get this camp created. And we can see the idealism with which a lot of young college age, age men um, entered the camp and, and, and hoped that not just by serving, but by demonstrating that African-Americans could also lead, that they would really help advance the cause. And I do really want to emphasize this because a lot of times when we think of civil rights, we emphasize equality. But in the military, that the military is not an institution that's about equality. It's about hierarchy and it's about rank and it's about command. And so for African-Americans to, to, to serve only in enlisted rank and not have the opportunity to show that they could also command and lead, they would really, in a sense, not be equal. They would be, they would be lesser. So this was, for many of this generation, an opportunity to turn that narrative um, around. And we can see here, and I just wanted to put this up, that just like an earlier uh, slides, um, that, that, this, that parents were very proud of their sons who were undertaking this, um, this challenge and this, cru this crusade. Now I will point out that the, um, the War Department uh, elected to create uh, two combatant divisions. The Army is segregated at this moment. Uh, two combatant divisions uh, for African-Americans and this would in fact give African-American officers places to, to command. Um, 
often alongside white officers as well. There was never, ever uh, any uh, thought of putting black officers in command of white units. I mean, that was definitely not gonna happen in the First World War. Um, but despite that decision to create uh, small opportunities for black officers um, to receive training and, and commissions and for there to be uh, two black combatant divisions, which ended up being about 40,000 men, the vast majority of African-American soldiers in the First World War were going to serve in non-combatant positions. It was about 89% of, of those African-Americans who served. And they were going to be detailed uh, either uh, behind the lines. So this is a, this is a, a scene um, from port in France where these men never, they, they sail to France, but they never get any farther or any closer to the front lines than this, where they're essentially working as stevedores. And you can see here that they're, they're wearing work overalls, sort of, you know, not that, a way of kind of having them even look a little civilian-like in their, in their dress. And, and they're under um, white non-commissioned uh, command here. So therefore, the very few men were going to have an opportunity to, to perform that type of valorous service that could be recognized um, as, as significant and therefore help advance the civil rights movement. We do have four uh, infantry regiments that are given to the French for the duration of the war, and one of those becomes the most famous infantry regiment um, in the African-American community, uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Infantry Regiment, you might have heard of them. They perform very well, um, but it leaves a bitter taste in, in the mouths of many African-Americans that the real chance to prove themselves came uh, by the French, not by American command. Those soldiers fought under French command, did well, were redecorated, um, whereas those soldiers who fought under the Americans, including Black officers like Houston, were denigrated for most of the war um, and did not actually receive the expectation, did not actually receive the, the recognition that they were expecting. Um, in addition, we have women who are serving during the war. And it's important to appreciate that there were opportunities for women who were motivated by a lot of the same concerns that men who enlisted or, or men who were conscripted uh, expressed. Um, we can see in some of these posters, especially by becoming a nurse, the, the idea of the romantic allure of, 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 of serving in France and, and, um, and also the need for professional training. So the idea that this could also become perhaps a potential career path for women after the war, they would gain experience and credentialing by their, their wartime service. Um, and then, you know, up here uh, in the upper right corner, the idea as well that by demonstrating their own patriotism and, and devotion to country, in a sense, uh, being willing to embrace the duties of citizenship, women could strengthen their uh, request or their demand that they also receive the full rights of citizenship, namely by having the right to vote. And we do see the successful passage of the 19th Amendment after the war, um, sort of connecting, connecting the dots a little bit, a little bit here. Um, now, Natalie Scott was a nurse and she became trained in 1916 and started learning French. She was ready to go if the Americans ever entered the war. She came, she originated from, from New Orleans. And sure enough, as soon as the war, Americans entered the war, she was successful in landing a spot in the Red Cross in Paris um, and, and eventually uh, ended up in a French hospital in Beauvais. And while she was there, the Germans actually launched um, an attack on the hospital and the artillery attack was so successful that the, um, uh, the first two floors of the, of the hospital were destroyed and she was awoken um, from a dead sleep by the sound of shells showering down on the hospital, jumped up, began, ran into the rubble and began pulling men out, wounded men out um, in order to bring them to safety. Um, she became famous for this, became known at, at home as the air raid maiden, and 
gained even more acclaim when she became the only American woman during the war to receive the, the Croix de Guerre uh, from the French government. So we see examples of stress and emotional turmoil, but also incredible heroism on the part of women who participated in the war. And many of them um, going into the war and and looking at their experience in some in very similar ways to, to to men who agreed to fight for it, and I I like Natalie's story because in some ways earlier I'm talking about men who believe they are fighting to protect home and hearth. You know they want their families to be proud of them. Uh, Natalie you know switches that gender narrative a little bit. She wants her parents to be proud of her too. She writes a lot to her family but she also demonstrates great heroism and she is the one saving men rather than vice versa. So we have to have room in our understanding of the war to, to capture her story as well. Now, moving along to what the male predominant experience was in fighting this conflict, there's again, uh, some nuance that we need to attach to our understanding of what the reality of war turned out to be. Now, for many of us, when we think about the First World War, I'm sure this is the kind of scene that conjure, it conjures up for, uh, in, your, in your brains, the idea of trench warfare. And uh, this is a kind of uh, interesting schematic, you know, layout of just the complexity of trench warfare and how the trench system operated. And, and while it's true that American soldiers, uh, especially ones who arrived um, early in um, 1918, uh, trained in the trenches and some of them occupied quiet sectors of the trench line uh, early, early in their uh, military experience. By the time the Americans arrived in force, in fact, the war had changed and a war of movement had been um, reignited along the Western Front. So the front had been stagnant for quite some time, really since the last big war of movement was in 1914, you know, when the, where the trench line was being established. And, but in 1918, things changed. And so the majority of the American co combat experience was not sitting in the trenches, in, enduring trench warfare. It really was um, with different challenges. And those challenges were um, not just breaking through the trench line, but how to sustain the momentum of in advance. And, and so this is where we're gonna see some of the problems that the Americans faced. So just to give you a kind of general overview, what changes in 1918? So in 1918, um, Russia signs a separate peace with Russia. And so up until this point, Russia had been in a two front war, but now the war in the East for Russia is for, for Russia and Germany is over. And this gives Germany the ability to transfer a lot of troops from the Eastern front to the Western front. And they're also stepping up uh, submarine warfare, hoping to disrupt the, the, the stream of men and material that's coming from the United States. So they take a gamble to try to end the war before America can really arrive in force. And they launch a massive offensive along the Western Front and succeed in breaking through. And you can kind of see um, you know, on this map just how far uh, towards Paris they get. They make a they make huge inroads, you know, a movement and a gain of territory, like I said, that has not been seen since 19, 1914. And so it's at this moment that we see America's America really entering uh, into the into the combat uh, in a significant way. And some of the initial um, battles that America fights, which is around Cantigny, Abella Wood, Chateau Thierry, this comes at a sort of crisis moment of the German breakthrough, where there's fear that they might get to Paris. There's fear that the that the whole line may collapse. And Pershing goes to the French and offers up the American troops that he has to fight under French command to basically stem this advance. And this is an important decision because up until that point, Pershing has been mostly focused on building up his own American independent military with the goal of America taking over its own independent sector of the front. At this moment, by offering that help, which um, you know it seems at, at that at that time to be exactly the right thing to do, he has to then also put aside temporarily his hopes of channeling all his energy into building this independent army. 
Uh, even, uh, even to the extent that he begins to privilege uh, shiploads of infantry troops from the United States, um, delaying uh, uh, his plan to be, be building up logistical support, um, either with materiel or, or those troops as, as people come across the Atlantic. And this is a big downside for the Americans because by delaying their ability to create their own support infrastructure and logistical support operations, when the United States finally does take over its next sector, which is sort of the next big thing that happens. So phase one in the American military experience is helping stem the German advance and then being part of the counteroffensives through the summer of 1918. And then in the fall of 1918, the second big thing that happens in the American combat experience is they do take over their own sector of the front, which is right down here. You can see it sort of in this, uh, the San Miguel Verdun area. Um, and, and in doing that and launching one of their first operations of the war, the San Miguel um, Offensive, which helps flatten a salient, they're, they're doing so in a, with a kind of underprepared, understaffed logistical operation. The third, Big phase for the American military experience comes in the Meuse or Gun campaign. And this campaign, it begins September 26th. It lasts until November 11th. It is the American contribution to a, 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 a front wide offensive that includes Britain to the north, France in the middle, America in the south. And it's a coordinated allied assault against German lines that um, something that had not been done before. Before in our battles, we have one sector fighting, the others are quiet. Um, the American presence in the lines allows for this coordinated ally strategy and this coordinated advance will will continue for up to six weeks and that will be the advance that finally brings germany to the negotiating table to negotiate an armistice that i discussed at the very beginning here now for the united states this muser gun campaign really is the pinnacle of their combat contribution to the war and it's where we get so many accounts of just what the what fighting uh in this war meant to american soldiers who are, who are fighting not stuck in the trenches, but in a heavily wooded area that brings about huge casualties. And I wanted to put this up because um, I would suspect that many of us, when we go for you know, information and we want a quick, easy fix, we hit Wikipedia. Um, and in Wikipedia, when we look at the most lethal American campaigns in American history, we see that the Muse or gun is number two, but it's completely unknown by most Americans. It doesn't surprise us to see World War II battles on this list, but it gives us a sense that this, this, is, a, this is a bloody, um, hard fought battle in which the United States takes serious casualties. Um, and you can just, you know, again, these numbers sort of give you the idea 47 day campaign, 1.2 million men involved in it. And you see the numbers of killed and wounded and stragglers, which gives a sense of a little bit of the disorganization at certain moments in the campaign. And this is, this is what they're fighting in. And this is densely wooded, it's very hilly, and they're, and they're needing to advance. And they're advancing against heavily defended uh, German fortifications. This is an area the Germans have held for, for nearly four years, and they've built very dense uh, fortifications in this area to, to, to hold it and to basically keep it a quiet sector for, for much, of the, much of the war. And when we think about those logistical problems that I was mentioning earlier, one of the other things that the Muser gun becomes sort of famous for is these terrible traffic jams in the in the rear. So uh, I live in Southern California, so I'm very well, uh, you know, aware of traffic jams and and the chaos it causes. But but in this particular traffic jam, I mean. These are, this is a traffic jam that's literally a matter of life and death for some of these units that are fighting on the front. So that those earlier decisions to um, delay the, 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 the logistical part of the, of the military apparatus um, begin to have some really negative implications in, uh, in the Muser gun campaign. 
And we have accounts from individual soldiers. And I think that some of these I wanted to just bring to your attention because this is where we start seeing in memoirs, um, especially soldiers recounting these moments of, of, of terror and the, the kind of, when you're, you're in the moment, the things that focus on your attention. And I feel that this, this, uh, this account from Lieutenant Kern and Ashby Williams is one of the most searing I've read of what it really means to be in, the, in, a, in an artillery barrage here. And, and he writes, one can only feel, one cannot describe the horror that fills the heart and mind during this short interval of time. You know he is aiming the gun at you and wants to kill you. You can hear the deadly missile singing as it comes towards you faintly at first, then distinctly, then louder and louder until it seems so loud that everything else has died. And then the earth shakes and the eardrums ring and dirt and iron reverberate through the woods and fall about you. This is what you hear, but no man can tell what surges through the heart and mind as you lie with your face upon the ground, listening to the growing sound of the hellish thing as it comes towards you. You do not think sorrow only fills the heart and you only hope and pray. And I think that these are the experiences that we can read many times over, perhaps not so poetically as Williams puts it, which helps us really understand what this fighting meant on the ground. Now, Charles Minder is another, another person who has a memoir that I think is quite searing in terms of, of talking about his experiences. And he's interesting because he's German American and he has many reflections of fighting in the Muser gun, um, especially his concern that he might be fighting directly against cousins and uncles he, he has who are serving in the German army. But in his account, we see how, how the kind of scene that Williams has, has staged can sometimes lead to hallucinations or, or actual mental breakdown on the, on, the, on the battlefield. Those logistical problems where men are not being fed, they're not, they're not um, having water, they, they sometimes don't know where they are, they don't understand the largest, larger tactical purpose of what, of what they're doing. That really comes through in Minder's account, and he recounts this moment where he's a machine gunner, and he he's he's they're moving forward after having taken out a German machine gun nest, and and he's walking up to these men on the ground, and he becomes convinced in his mind that he has just killed his uncle, and he walks up to the man, and he turns him over, and it is not his uncle, but but he basically has a complete breakdown on the battlefield. And that gives us a little insight into, I think, something we do commonly associate with the First World War, which is shell shock. And shell shock um, is, is, a, is a condition in, in terms of how men sort of reach their breaking points, either both on the battlefield or after at, or long after something we might now call PTSD, which becomes a signature feature of the war. And it is worth noting that three out of four hospital beds in, 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 the, in veterans hospitals after the war will be filled by men who are, are, are still suffering from the effects of shell shock or PTSD. Gas was another signature feature of the First World War. This was a war where chemical weapons were widely used, especially in 1918. And mustard gas was one of the most feared. Mustard gas was a gas that um, lingered for a long time in low-lying areas and puddles and in the trenches and in, and in forested um, terrain um, and attacked the body uh, anywhere where there was moisture. And so we have this kind of famous painting by John Singer Sargent of, of soldiers whose eyes have been affected by gas. And this account from Noble Sissel, an African-American soldier who serves in the 369th Infantry Regiment, that one of those regiments that served with the French and was the Harlem, it was the Harlem, Harlem, Harlem Hellfighter Regiment, so honored by them. Um, but in this account, he's talking 20 years later about visiting his memories of visiting a gas ward and seeing the suffering um, there. Um, the places, he says, where the eyes were, were just large bleeding scabs. Others, their mouths were just one mass of sores. Others had their hands up and there were terrible burns beneath their arms where the gas had attacked the moisture there. And so I mentioned that, that a vast majority of beds in veterans hospitals were reserved for men who had still were still suffering from shell shock. Well, 
the, the, the other beds were reserved for men who were suffering from gas-related tuberculosis. So these lingering problems, health problems that veterans had into the post-war period demonstrated, um, as we know, that sometimes the wounds that men are coming back with are not just simply ones where we can see wounds to their to their to their bodies, say through from from shrapnel or or from machine gun fire, but these were wounds that sometimes took time to manifest themselves, especially in the case of ga of gas related tuberculosis and um, PTSD. Going back to the beginning of my lecture, we've we've already discussed November 11th. November 11th comes and goes, and men come home, and they find that. Besides health-related issues, the reintegration into American society is not, is not easy. I mentioned earlier on Charles Hamilton Houston, and you remember going to that training camp, his, his hopes and his expectations um, that this would be a war in which his participation could help advance the civil rights movement. He comes home quite disillusioned in terms of what his experience has actually been. He talks about the hate and scorn that he's treated, the unrelenting racism within the American military, the, the inability of the U.S. military uh, to have faith in American, uh, in African Americans as combat troops or as officers. But nonetheless, he's undergone a, tra a political transformation. And he writes, I made up my mind that if I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. Now, Charles Hamilton Houston is a famous person in American history because he is the one who ultimately devises the NAACP's legal strategy that culminates in the Brown versus Board of Education desegregation uh, Supreme, Supreme Court case. So he comes home changed and determined to devote his life to the civil rights movement. And we see that multifold um, uh, in the stories of Black veterans coming home. And the civil rights movement really does enter a new phase as a result of the First World War. There's a new militancy in it, a new insistence. We have a terminal, term, the new Negro, that comes into vogue to kind of explain how this generation is, is determined to make progress for civil rights. And so that hope that veterans, that Black veterans had had entering into the military, the disillusionment, that they experienced in many cases, their positive experiences interacting with French civilians, all of that contributes to this war being a major turning point in the, in the creation of the modern civil rights movement that creates people um, like, like Houston. Other problems we see with reintegration speak more to those hopes for economic um, advancement, those positive things that veterans had attributed uh, or had hoped um, that their military service would bring for them. Uh, we come back in 1918, the economy falls into recession. Uh, there's a lot of, of unemployment, um, a lot of strikes, race rioting, a lot of uncertainty in American society. Veterans don't have big programs to help them get back on their feet. The war actually ended way quicker than the American government was, was uh, expecting. And also there wasn't really the idea that the government would need to provide lots of social services or aid for veterans to reintegrate. Um, this proves a mistake. And in 1924, the American Legion, which is a World War I created organization, it's the American Legion is founded by World War I veterans, is able to successfully lobby for something known as adjusted compensation. And this is a bond that, um, that um, American veterans receive, and it depends on how long they served, but the average veteran could expect to receive about $1,200. However, they have to wait 20 years to get it. That all sounds good until the Great Depression, then veterans begin clamoring to have this adjusted compensation certificate paid early. And that leads to events such as the bonus march on Washington DC, which you may have heard of. In 1936, they're successful and they finally do get their adjusted compensation certificate um, cashed out early if they, if they want. Where does all of this lead for us? Well, it leads to some important things because World War veterans are, are sort of middle-aged men during World War II. And in World War II, the Legion steps up with another important campaign, which is to ensure that the United States learns lessons from the past and doesn't 
repeat the same mistakes when it welcomes home the World War II generation. And the American Legion is successful in 1944 in helping push through the GI Bill of Rights, which I think we all know was a major jump start for lots of, of American veterans returning home to receive um, college education, unemployment benefits, um, be they help them become homeowners, kind of help military service serve that promise of becoming a, 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 a way to step up the social eco economic ladder that it had not it had not proven in in, in the in the first world war. Um, so that's a lot uh, of taking us on a long journey here in terms of thinking about um, some perhaps new ways to think about American military service in the first world war. I do think that Veterans Day offers us an opportunity to think broadly about honoring veterans for their service to their nation, but it also gives us a moment to pause and think about that day's origins and to, to have perhaps a new appreciation for the, the uh, First World War in American history and for the very particular service that these men and women rendered the nation at that time. Thank you very much.